Thanks so much. I'm happy to participate in these events every year. Um, in the past, I've been very much focused on open access and institutional, institutional open access policies and repositories. Um, and now uh, I've turned my attention quite a bit towards, I think, the last frontier in open access, which is uh, trying to capture all of the content that is hidden uh, during a process of scholarly communication, which we all know to be uh, called peer review. So um, I'm sure you all heard of one way or another that peer review more or less began about 350 years ago with the uh, first formal journal of philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Um, and in this early effort to organize scientific thought into a journal, uh, we have the establishment of some important principles about scientific priority, what work is important, and um, we set forward this idea of peer review. Um, and so peer review has obviously um, become an important part of the scholarly uh, communication process and the scholarly publication process. It hasn't really changed much in 350 years, and most of the conventions that we have in peer review came about in the 1950s. Um, and there's so much written about problems with peer review, and I, you know, we could spend all day just talking about peer review uh, and the problems and, and um, have heated debates. Um, but you know, as we all know, peer review can be tediously slow, petty, unfair, biased, it lacks transparency, accountability, recognition, generally relies on the experts of a couple people, two or three people, which may or may be not be well matched to read the article that they're evaluating um, based on you know, who's out of town on vacation and, and the availability of all kinds of reviewers. Um, we all know that it can erroneously reject scientifically valid papers and erroneously accept scientifically flawed papers. Um, and you know, from a faculty member's point of view, uh, we know that the whole system survives on the backs of free labor and researchers, peer reviewers, and editors who are often very busy don't have a precise subject matter expertise and have their own agendas and their own priorities. Um, the, the piece that I want to focus on is this uh, tremendous amount of intellectual capital and investment that goes unaccounted for and uncaptured during the peer review process. Um, we know that typical uh, reviewers spend about five hours per review, uh, around eight articles a year. I think that number is low uh, for many people. Um, and these are data from SCM Report 2009. Um, there are about 1.8 to 1.9 million peer-reviewed articles published every year. So if you do the math on that, uh, it's about 5 million peer reviews if each paper was reviewed only once. And all of us know that you know, to get a paper peer-reviewed only once in one journal is an unlikely event. So you can do the math on that and know that there are a lot of peer reviews out there. And they contain some very useful information. Uh, we did a calculation um, back in 2013 that UC authors or UC faculty, academic senate faculty, contribute about $21 million based on FTEs and time and numbers of peer reviews back to the, to the publishing system uh, that they never recoup. Um, but again, the other part of this is that there are valuable, uh, evaluative information about all the published articles that's rarely available to researchers, to students, or to the public. And there would be a great public benefit um, and a great benefit to the research enterprise, I think, if that content was available. Uh, so, I'd like just to uh, put forward this idea of open peer review. There's a lot of people talking about this. There are many efforts in many different ways that people are approaching this, and, and we've heard a little bit about that already today. Um, but really, uh, you can think about open peer review. You can break it down into uh, pre-publication peer review and think about how transparency in the, the pre-publication peer review process would generate accountability, assign credit for that work, promote fairness in the peer review process, expose conflicts of interest, and capture valuable intellectual assets and contributions that faculty make. Um, there are many systems for post-publication peer review. We've heard about Science Open and, and, um, and others. This enables greater participation of people who really are subject matter experts, creates dialogue between authors and readers, accelerates the rate of discovery, enhances reproducibility, and reduces, maybe even eliminates retractions, builds communities, facilitates collaborations, and makes publication a dynamic versus a static process. And so, uh, we've got many of the um, thought leaders in this movement uh, here today in the room. There are many others that are trying pre-publication peer review models, others that are, are focusing on the peer reviews themselves, and others that are working hard to create post-publication peer review um, environments. And I just want to point everyone's attention to public commons if you haven't seen it. These are some uh, examples I pulled off from today. Um, where people, if they publish in PubMed, they can participate in the commenting feature. Here's the first one, an interesting paper, but coordinates 
provided in Table 1 are not MNI space, they are likely MN coordinates, which also provides uh, also provided by the analytics offer. Can the authors provide a correct coordinates and perhaps as an erratum? So you can kind of see how a dialogue gets established. Um, and with that, you can appreciate that there's tremendous value in bringing a larger community and associating that with the papers. So thank you for your time.